Hello everyone, uh, my name is John. I'm a PhD student at, at Helpert University Nijmegen. I, I just handed in my thesis. And uh, for the first few years of my PhD, I uh, spent a lot of time thinking about uh, well, the questions related to how you can derive quantum theory, quantum physics from first principles. And another way you could phrase that, uh, you could phrase the question, or you could, an, another name for this course could be why quantum theory? And that's kind of the question I'm interested in. And of course, this is a philosophical question, and there is no definitive answer to this. But the way I like to think about this question is through sort of more, more of a mathematical lens. And basically, like how you could derive quantum theory, the mathematics of quantum theory, so operator algebras, Hilbert spaces, the Schrodinger equation, form a more grounded, a principled approach. Um, so that's what this course is going to be about. Um, to make a bit more clear why I want to take this approach to answer this question, why quantum theory, I first want to look at why, why relativity. Um, I'm not an expert in relativity, and there are a few experts here in the room, so if I say something wrong, like please correct me. Um, in general, if I say something that's unclear to any of you, feel free to ask questions. Uh, if I use notation or if I use a concept that's new, like please ask a question because like, I don't know exactly what the background is of everyone here. Uh, at some point, I will ask you to like raise your hand. Like I will ask you, like, uh, do you know this? And raise your hand if you know this, because I'm interested in seeing how widespread these things that to me are very natural or very canonical are. Um, and yeah. Okay. So why relativity? So um, relativity is a really interesting theory from like from like a historical viewpoint because Einstein didn't really do it, uh, derive it from experiments. Like he just said, like I just take two physical principles. There's principles being uh, that the speed of light is constant and that uh, the physical laws are the same regardless of your reference frame. Um, and from this he could like derive, like, oh, space-time needs to be like Minkowski space-time and we need to have Lorentz transformations to like, uh, do translations between, between reference frames. Um, and at the time there wasn't really much evidence to support this. Like there were, there were the Max and Morley in, in, in uh, interferometer experiments that showed that maybe the speed of light is indeed constant depending on like uh, ir 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 irrelevant of like how fast you were moving. Um, but like I don't think Einstein was really aware of that or really cared about that result much. He just like thought about this a lot and like just figured like okay these things seem very natural to me. Let's see what I, let's see what I can derive from that. Uh, it took him 10 more years to formalize the third principle. As far as I understand, he already had this principle in his mind for a long time, but it took him a long time to get the right mathematics to like, support it, which is that the gravitational and inertial acceleration are in fact equivalent. And like from that you can do with, like, re, uh, with, like Riemannian geometry, you can do a lot of stuff. And incredibly, like, even though he had almost zero evidence for this stuff, it is still seems mostly correct at like, large-scale structures. Like, I don't think there's any evidence that goes against it, like, if you go up to a sufficient skill. Again, correct me if I'm wrong about this, but, yeah. Um, okay, so, that kind of points towards a few benefits of starting from physical principles and deriving your theory from that. Uh, namely, it's productive. Like, he really didn't have a lot of evidence, but still he found the correct theory. Which sort of seems to point towards the universe being based on these principles, right? Because otherwise, like, why would he be able to find the correct theory from principles? Like, it just doesn't make sense, like, from a, like, uh, information standpoint. Like, he didn't have a lot of bits of information to work from, so. Um, what I found interesting is it motivates the mathematical structure of the theory. So, like, if you ask the question, like, why, why is space-time curved? You can just answer, well, uh, if you accept the equivalence principle, it needs to be curved. Like, it just, it's a consequence of it. Um, it also points to meaningful experiments, like if you say my principle is the speed of light is constant no matter, no, matter, no matter how fast you're going, well you can test that, that's just an experiment, and it's a clear experiment you can test. It's also aesthetically pleasing, right, because you can, you, can, you can start your course on general relativity saying we have these three principles, and they just do, you just you do mathematics to it, and like boom, you get the entire theory. So it's really pleasing in that sense. Uh, and it also helps to search for generalizations, like if you expect this is not the correct theory, well, if these principles like force you to have this structure, then you know, like, okay, I need to relax the principles somehow to get a generalization out of it. Um, doesn't completely hold true for relativity because, like, it's the mathematics are not like forced exactly by the principles; it's more like suggested by the principles. But yeah. Okay, so what I want to do in this course is I want to find principles for quantum theory, but hopefully have these properties as well, like 
So it's like, that's the kind of reason I want to search for these things. Okay, so back to quantum theory. And I want to give sort of a very short historical introduction to quantum theory and how it is different from the history of relativity. Um, so you could argue that it started in 1900 by Planck. Uh, who um, wanted to resolve the ultraviolet catastrophe. So this was um, that, um, yeah, like, who, who knows this actually? Who, who knows this term, ultraviolet catastrophe? Like, okay, like it's most people in the room, so I'm just gonna, gonna carry on. But like, yeah, he, 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 he said like, okay, if it is possible that the energy comes in discrete packets, then like, it all works out nicely. But he said like, it was mathematical fiction. He didn't actually believe this was the case. Um, and five years later, Einstein explained, explained the photoelectric effect, uh, also by postulating that light comes in, comes in discrete particles. I'm not sure Einstein believed at this point that actually light should be discrete particles. I think it was also just a mathematical fiction for him. Uh, 1913, Bohr also used this fiction of like having, having discrete energy packets to explain the spectral lines of the hydrogen atom. Um, and the thing is that these were all very ad hoc. They just like said like, okay, if I do this thing, then like I get the right outcomes. But there wasn't a unifying theory behind it and why this should be. Uh, and it took like uh, quite some more years to actually find this theory. So Heisenberg, born in Jordan, they developed something called matrix mechanics. Schrodinger developed something called wave mechanics. Uh, also, they seemed the two different theories to do it. But then uh, von Neumann, in a series of papers, he developed sort of a general mathematical framework that. Uh, engulf these two different approaches, and they showed that these two approaches were actually equivalent. And uh, it's culminated in his book, uh, Mathematische Grundlagen der Quantum Mechanik. And this is basically the mathematics he developed is the ones we're still using now. Okay, so it took 30 years to actually develop the right mathematics. So it's actually a way more convoluted story than for relativity. Um, Okay, so let me just go over the mathematical quantum theory. Like, I think most people here are, are familiar with it, but just to like have sort of a sort of a general grounding of what we're working from. Okay, so uh, every physical system we represent by a complex Hilbert space uh, that I'm usually going to write with like this very curly H. Uh, and then the states of a system are just unit vectors in this Hilbert space up to a global phase. And I'm just going to use the rack notation to write my uh, unit vectors like this. Uh, physical observables are self joint operators, and the expectation value is calculated by taking the inner product on both sides with the state. Okay? Uh, and if the energy of a system is given by an observable H, the Hamiltonian, uh, then the system evolves as in this manner, which is kind of like the Schrodinger, this basically the Schrodinger equation, but then written without the, uh, the Planck's constant, but like just mathematically. This, this is if your Hamiltonian is time independent. It's, it's time independent, yeah. The others need to integrate the stuff. But, yeah. 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 but like, you, can, you could argue that like, the core theory should be time independent. But, like, if, it, if it's not time independent, it's because of an external force, you're not modeling the entire system. But yeah. Okay. And then, the uh, last thing, the Hilbert space of composite system, you just take the tensor products of your Hilbert spaces and you do some stuff and you get. So, this is basically the mathematics of quantum theory, like of non, non, non relativistic, non quantum field theory, just standard quantum theory, right? Okay, this raises a lot of questions. So, first question, why Hilbert space? Why should it be complex? Why not a real Hilbert space? Why not a Hilbert space over some other ring or field? Uh, why are the states unit vectors? Why do you need to take them up to a global phase? Why do we represent observables by linear upwards on the Hilbert space? And why must they be self-adjoint? Why do we calculate uh, the expectation values of these things, probabilities, by the inner product? Why is the time evolution given by a unitary map of this particular form? Why do we describe a composite system by a tensor product? Okay. So these are a lot of questions that from the mathematics you just say, well, just accept these mathematics, this is just the way it is, right? And it's very unsatisfying, at least for me. Okay, so the goal is to hopefully find a more satisfying answer to these, to these questions. So yes? The, those are a priori questions. Um, Question a priori, because you can just ask an answer like uh, it works. Of course, you can answer it works, but that's... Uh, okay, so yeah, yeah. the question you address is that could we find a... <coughs> um, We're trying to understand why it works, yeah. I think. Yeah, like why would we have a complex level space? Like why not something else? That's basically yeah. what I'm trying to yeah. 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 say. Yeah, for fundamental principles. So you could say like, well, you do experiments and you see that this is the correct description, but yeah, I want something more fundamental. Mm -hmm. Okay, 
Uh, well, people have been, answer, have been asking this question for like a hundred years now. Basically, since von Neumann had his book and it was clear what the mathematics should be, the question was like, why would it, why would you be those mathematics? Um, and you could argue that the early works, 1930 to 1960, they were more focused on trying to generalize it. So they say like, okay, we have complex verbal spaces. Well, um, maybe our theory is incorrect. Maybe we need a generalization of this. Can we find such a generalization? Um, and so they tried many different things, and mostly this failed. Like they always came back to the answer of like, we tried to generalize, but we got back to the same point where we started. And that's um, kind of like a true line of like, okay, you have, if, if your mathematics are nice enough, you get back to complex level spaces, which is kind of an explanation of why you get to mathematics. Um, later work was like focused on this question, like why do we always fail to generalize quantum mechanics? So why is quantum mechanics inevitable? Um, and like it was also posed by uh, Mackey first that like uh, we need to find like principles from which you derive quantum mechanics. So that's uh, kind of like where this project started of like really like can we do it for first principles? Yes. I have a question. I'm not sure what you mean by generalizing quantum mechanics. Um, In what sense? <coughs> what sense? So um, like for instance, like if we say like observables are self generated operators in the Hilbert space, like. Uh, if you take a C star algebra, that's like sort of like a generalization of that. Um, but C star algebras turn out to always be represented in the complex Hilbert space. Um, so it, it's generalized as in like um, something that includes quantity is a special case, but actually allows for more general systems or for more general dynamics. Um, yeah, so um, there was a lot of work done on quantum logic uh, in the like 1960s, 1980s. Uh, also to try to see like can we derive uh, Hilbert space from just abstract lattice theoretic arguments, uh, which was sort of finished in 1995 by 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 by, by Solaris theorem, which I'm hopefully going to get to at the end of this lecture. Um, and the modern work, which I'm going to spend most of this lecture series on, uh, from like the year 2000, it uses operational framework. So it really asks like. Um, like, if I'm in a lab and I can do experiments, like, what do I expect the outcomes of the experiments to be? And then you have certain principles for that, and from that you derive that you need quantum mechanics. So that's one what, that's what I'm going to spend most of the time on. Okay. Yeah, so these lectures are going to be four. Uh, first, in this lecture, I'm basically only going to do mathematics up to, like, 1960. Uh, so everything was done up to then. Um, in the next lecture, I'm going to introduce uh, some mathematics regarding ordered vector spaces and things called generalized probabilistic theories. And I'm gonna I'm gonna walk through some modern reconstructions and like what kind of principles do they require and how do they how do they derive quantum mechanics. Uh, then the third lecture I'm gonna talk about um, it's a bit of rework partial reconstructions. So it's basically like not trying to reconstruct all of quantum theory, but just saying like if I have a theory with this principle, then I get this behavior from from quantum mechanics. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about about a, about a reconstruction of my own. Um, and like sort of walk you through a more detailed step, sort of see like how would you go about arriving this kind of stuff. Uh, and in the final lecture, I want to um, go even more general and even like let go of like the, the the concept of probabilities as being real numbers between zero and one, and seeing how you can even derive that kind of stuff. Okay. So uh, yeah, let's start with some like classic results. Then now. Uh, all right. Yeah. Alright, so the goal of this lecture is not to establish like the end all be all principles of quantum theory. It's more showing you like different ways in which you could do it. And like I don't believe we found the principles of quantum theory in the same sense that we have the principles of relativity. Like I hope we will at some point like converge on like the right answer there. But like we're not there yet, I think. Okay. Yeah, so some classical results. Um, Wigner's theorem. Who here uh, has heard of Wigner's theorem? Like, I'm curious to see. Like, uh, okay, so about about half. I'd say. Okay, so um, this basically concerns itself with the question of why time evolution should be unitary. Um, so f before we can like get to Wigner's theorem, we need a few definitions. So tr the transition probability of a state uh, psi to state phi is just given by taking um, taking the inner product uh, absolute absolute value square it. That you get, so this is called the Born rule, right? Um, you can call this the transition probability. It's the probability that if, you, uh, if your state is actually in a state psi, but you're measuring if it's in state phi, then you, you get that outcome with this probability. Uh, just a side note um, it's interesting that this is symmetric in the states. 
And this is not true for all hypothetical theories you could write down. And this is sometimes used as sort of a principle to derive quantum mechanics. You say like it has symmetry of transition probabilities. Mm -hmm. and you could argue this follows from like time, time symmetry and stuff, but uh, it's not trivial that this would be true in any theory. Um, okay. I mean, you can find the projective Hilbert space, which is basically uh, the state space of your Hilbert space. So it just consists of these uh, complex rays of, uh, of your vectors. Uh, you can just see this as your state space of your Hilbert space. And we can define a symmetry of the state space to be a bijective function um, that preserves the transition probabilities. Okay? Because that's basically the only structure we have on these states. So we just ask it to preserve the structure we have. Um, and the Rigner's theorem says that any such symmetry must be implemented by a unitary map or an anti-unitary map. So we have this map U from the Hilbert space to itself and that maps these vectors into one another. So we sort of get like this, uh, that things must be unitary or anti-unitary from just requiring that, it, of course, um, your time evolution must be bijective because you want to be able to reverse it and it must preserve transition probabilities. Uh, you could argue, like, why should it preserve transition probabilities? And that's a good question. Uh, but it turns out that if you also consider mixed states and not just pure states, you can get rid of this assumption and like you also get unitary maps out of it. Okay, so we're going to go about the second classic result, which is uh, Stone's theorem on one-parameter unitary groups. Who here has heard of Stone's theorem? I think it's a bit, bit more obscure, but uh, okay. What is it about? Um, so okay, if, if you haven't heard of it, so okay. Yeah, so uh, the question that Stone's theorem actually tries to answer is, given that we know that our state space is like is like um, is uh, is uh, a normalized state in Hilbert space. And given that we know time evolution is unitary, uh, why should it be of this form? Like, why do we have this kind of equation for a self adjoint uh, for a self adjoint operator? Um, okay, so we can try to do this from first principles, and we say, okay, we have our time evolution of the state, and it's given by some set of unitaries, and like we parameterize it by this this uh, value t for a time. Okay, so what should this satisfy this family of unitaries? Well, of course. If no time is passed, it's just identity, right? So u0, we say, is identity. Okay, well, what we also know, if you first evolve over time t, and then we evolve over time s, it's the same as evolving in a single step from time t plus s. So we want our unitaries to have, like, if we first do t and then s, it's the same as doing t plus s at the same time, okay? So then what we get is we get a group homomorphism from the real numbers into uh, the unitaries. And this is called a one-parameter unitary group. Okay. Now there's one more condition we can reasonably expect, which is that like as time, like as we decrease the amount of time that has passed, we expect to get the uh, the original state back, because it's kind of like like a like a like, like a continuity argument for the time evolution that you want these states to evolve smoothly over time, right? And this thing is then called a strongly continuous one-parameter unitary group. And Stone's theorem says that any such one parent unitary group that must exist a self adjoint operator H such that they're of this form. Okay? Now, the <coughs> proof of this is actually not that hard in finite dimension, if the dimension if you have to do some functional analysis, but in finite dimension it's actually quite, quite nice. So, um, first of all, t plus s is the same as doing t plus s, but then you, also this is s plus t, so this you get s plus t, so all the unitaries commute. Okay? So they are all simultaneously diagonal, di, diagonal, diagonalizable. Right? Uh, so we get some diagonal matrix here, dt. And we know the eigenvalues of a unitary matrix are always of the form e to the i, some function. So this dt is of this form. Like we get a diagonal matrix with these complex faces on the diagonal. And of course, like these dt's must have the same property of adding together like this. So these uh, functions alpha, j, they are uh, additive. Okay, um, because we uh, re because we require that this unitary group is continuous, you can show these alpha j must actually be linear and not just additive, uh, and hence they are uh, like you have some value h j so that they are of this form, and then you can just write uh, d t is uh, e to the i t some diagonal matrix, so hence we get the, we get the equation we want. So it's really quite a basic kind of proof. In infinite dimensional, you need to do some functional analysis, some, fun some funky stuff with spectral theorem. But uh, yeah, this is the basic idea. 
Okay, so this is already quite interesting. So if we combine Wigner's theorem and Stone's theorem, then we basically get Schrodinger's equation, right? Um, so if we know that like we need complex Hilbert spaces and our states need to be this particular type of states, and we have transition probabilities, we want to preserve them, then like we get unitary maps out of it, and we get uh, via Stone's theorem we get like this kind of like evolution in time. So we get uh, like uh, Schrodinger's equation. So that's already like quite cool that you are forced to have this kind of dynamics. Okay, is that clear? Is there any questions about that so far? Okay. <coughs> uh, yeah. So now the truth class scribble solve. Let me just check how much time. Okay. Is uh, Gleason's theorem. So I just want to have a show of hands again. Who knows Gleason's theorem? Okay, that's a few people. Okay, I was expecting, especially the, the mathematical physics people, to know, but okay. Okay, so um, now we need to go away from pure quantum mechanics and introduce density operators first. So I'm just gonna like this, for now for this slide just to look at finite dimensional Hilbert spaces. Uh, so we call these uh, normalized states. We call those pure states, right? And it's useful to represent these by projections instead, instead of just a vector which represents as a one-dimensional projection. Okay, now the way we get mixed states is we take a probability distribution over pure states. Okay, so we take uh, this operator rho, and it's a linear combination of these pure states, psi i, and we uh, just have this probability distribution of this lambda i. Okay. Uh, or we, can be, uh, we can also define this another way, for that we need the notion of positive operator. So an operator between whole states is positive when it has, an, when it has a positive expectation value for every state, is a way you could phrase it. Okay. Uh, and it turns out in finite dimension, the, the density operators are precisely those positive operators which have traced one. Okay, I think this is relatively common knowledge, but uh, uh, yeah. Okay, so um, yeah, so observables are self joint operators in Hilbert spaces. Expectation value is given by this formula. Uh, in finite dimensional, in finite dimension, using the spectral theorem, we can always write a, a self joint operator as a linear combination of projections. Um, and then the probability that we observe the outcome, like lambda i for this observable, is then given by the Born rule in this formula. So we can write this, this thing also via the trace. And this allows us to generalize it to mixed states. So then the probability that we uh, observe the outcome associated to lambda i for a mixed state rho is then given by this trace formula. Okay? So then the question is, is basically, like, why should we calculate it with the trace? Like, why, why is this the way we calculate probabilities? Okay, so uh, let's rephrase this a bit, and so let me say that for every projection, uh, sorry, for, for every density operator row, we get a function that goes from the projection of the Hilbert space into the real unit interval, okay? And it associates to each projection a probability that's given by the stress. So we can, we can sort of generalize this, and you can sort of ask, okay, let's define a frame function to be any function from the projections into the, the into the unit interval, such that um, a a basis of projections, so if the projections sum up to the identity operator, then it must sum to one, which is kind of like it's a probability distribution, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is a frame function. So Gleason's theorem says that if I have such a frame function for a complex global space that is of dimension greater than two then there must be a density operator that implements this frame function, okay, with, with this trace formula here. So this gives us from first principles that if we accept that, like, uh, our projections are sort of the things that, like, observe, uh, correspond to, like, the things we can measure, um, then, like, this must be, like, the probabilities we get out of it, then our states must be density operators, because they're the only way in which we can associate probabilities in a consistent manner to these projections. <laughs> If your whole space is dimension greater than two, which is kind of like technical thing there, yeah. So as a result, like if your node measurements are projections in the complex Hilbert space, then the states must be density operators, and we get the Born rule <coughs> out of it. And we know like what probabilities must correspond to with density operators. Yeah. So those notes, it's not true when dimension of Hilbert space is two. Uh, the reason for that is quite complex, but um, the way the proof of Gleason's theorem works is you look at um, the one-dimensional projections. And in dimension three or higher, if I fix one dimensional projection, I still have two dimensions left at least, so I can uh, 
like rotate any basis there. So I have, I have many different atomic projections that this thing corresponds to in a frame. But in dimension two, if I fix an atomic projection, then there's a unique one that's orthogonal to it. So I don't have enough information, and I can, I can like make weird kind of um, uh, yeah, measurement functions. Um, however, if we instead uh, take this function not just to be of the projections, but we take all effects, so those are all positive operators beneath identity, then this proof actually becomes quite trivial to prove, and it also holds for dimension two. So I think uh, um, in the next lecture we'll see like a version of that. So like there's a way to get like Gleason in a more easy manner from this. Okay. Yeah, so like we can combine these three classical results of Gleason, Wigner, and Stone. I also want to say like the last like the all the, the newest one of this is 1957. So we've known this for a long time. This is possible. Um, yeah, so suppose we know that the observables correspond to self adjoint operators in the complex Hilbert space. Okay, then Gleason's theorem tells us that our states must be represented by density operators. Uh, the extreme points of this set of density operators are precisely the pure quantum states. So then we get the pure quantum states from this, which is nice. Then Wigner's theorem tells us, okay, we must have like unitary maps are the symmetries of this thing. And then Stone's theorem tells us, well, uh, the only possible time dimensions we can have for this are sort of given by Schrodinger equation. So we get a whole lot of this like for free, basically. Like we could argue that like if I give an infinitely smart person and I say the observables of, of, of the, the theory of, of physics we have are represented by, by self adjoint operators in the complex Hilbert space, then he could just say, oh well, uh, I have Gleason's theorem, I have uh, I have Wigner's theorem, I have Stone's theorem, I put them all together and I get I, I, and I get Schrodinger's equation and I get density operators, I get the pure quantum states, I get all of this for free, basically. Okay. So, then really the main question we need to ask is why do we model observables by self adjoint operators in the complex Hilbert space? And that is basically the main question I want to try to answer during this lecture series because this is the most fundamental question. Once you have this, like with all the results, you get all this other stuff from quantum theory. And then the side question is why are composite systems described by a tensor product of Hilbert spaces? Um, and that's I think it's the less interesting question, and it's also easier answered once you know the first one. So, yeah, I'm going to spend most of this time in this lecture series on the first bit here. Okay. Is this so far so clear? Are there any questions at this point? Okay, so like, let's look at uh, observables a bit more. Let's look at self adjoint operators in complex Hilbert space. Okay? Um, the way I want to do this is with three generalizations of this <coughs> idea. Um, so it's looking at them at C star algebras, Jordan algebras, and automodular lattices. It's three different ways to like, sort of abstract this kind of structure. Okay, so first operator algebras. Um, for some more uh, background, um, if I, have, if I have some operator between Hilbert spaces, uh, we call it bounded when um, I can uh, bound the maximum norm that a vector gets out of it. Um, and we denote the space of bounded operators by B of H. It's just generalization. And then every, every one of these things has like an operator norm defined as like the... As like the uh, I think this should be supremum actually. Yeah, this should be supremum, sorry. It's like the maximum value that you can increase the norm of a vector by. Okay. So let's just take some subset of the bounded operators, a uh, complex linear subspace, which is closed in the operator norm. So if I, uh, um, if I um, take a series in this norm and like, it converges, then like, it should also be in the space. And it's closed on the adjoints. So if I have A in the set, then a dagger should also be in the set. Uh, I'm going to write adjoints by a uh, dagger, not a star. Like, I hope that's, that's fine. Yeah. It also should be close in the composition, right? So if I have A and B in there, then A times B or like A composed with B should also be in there. And well, what are the properties of such an A? Well, A is a complex Banach space, and that basically just means Banach just means it is the space has a norm and is complete in this norm. Um, so this should be complete, um, and it is an algebra in the sense that uh, this composition of operators makes it into an associative algebra. Okay. Um, 
And then the final structure it has is the adjoint acts on it as a Sesky linear involution. So involution means if I do it twice, I get the original thing back. Sesky linear means um, it's if I do a real number to it, I can just pull it out just like a linear function. But if it's a complex number, I need to take the complex conjugate of the number to take it out. Uh, and it has these two extra properties that the, 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 the conjugate, the adjoint, uh, flips the order of the product. And it has this interesting property with respect to the norm. Okay? So we can just take this structure and just abstract it. And we just say a C star algebra is precisely a structure which has all this, these properties. So it's a complex Banach space. It has a Sesky linear involution with a star. And it's also an associative algebra under a product, so just in front of it is a dot. And it has these two properties, right? It's the abstract definition for an algebraic structure, which you can then argue like this is sort of an abstract version of operators on the complex level space. Okay? Uh, who here has seen C star algebra before? Okay, that's, uh, okay. that's half. So I have a question. Yeah? So why, why choosing those properties of the space to generalize? Is it connected to some quantum intuition or? Um, well, I would say that the dagger is sort of associated to a time inverse. Um, so, so like if you have a dagger, like you can take like uh, you can take time reversals of things. Yeah, it's only true for unitaries, read, really, but not really for other things. Um, uh, you could argue that 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 is related to the inner product of the Hilbert space that you have a dagger structure on there. Um, I mean, this, this norm condition, like there's many ways you can phrase it, there's many equivalent definitions there. So like it, it's, uh, this might be a bit weird, but you can replace it with other things which might be more natural. Um, and I think this thing is really just a nice, like you need some way to relate your product, your algebra structure, which is star, right? You need something that relates those two. Otherwise, it's just like, just anything, you can just add a star to anything. Um, yeah. But of course, you can argue like this is a natural definition. And, like, I think lots of generalizations of Caesar algebras have been discussed in literature and like, people have thought a lot about this. Because it's, it's become its own, its own field and its own right. So, um, so there's this thing, the gelfand Neimark theorem from 1943, which says that if I have a Caesar algebra, uh, then there exists a complex Hilbert space um, and a norm-preserving, algebra-preserving, star-preserving embedding that goes into the op operators in the Hilbert space, the bounded operators in the Hilbert space. So if I have this abstract structure, I can always represent it concretely in a complex Hilbert space. So in this sense, C star algebras are not a generalization at all. They're just an abstract way to represent observables on the quantum system. Okay. But it's not unique, right? Uh, no, there's many ways you can represent it. Yeah. I mean, like if you have a BFH and you embed this into a bigger Hilbert space, like you can just mm -hmm. compose these two yeah. things, right? So. Yeah, it's definitely it's, not. Unique. Is it based on the, the GNS construction? Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay, so if like, I don't know exactly why Caesar algebras were invented, but if the goal was oh we want to like look at a more abstract or more general framework of quantum theory, they failed because like this shows like you just get back to quantum theory. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so um, just a few more facts about finite dimensional Caesar algebras which are useful. Um, if I have two if I have two Caesar algebras, I can take the direct sum which is just the Cartesian product and just take pointwise operations. So just addition is defined pointwise, the product is, the product is defined pointwise, the star is defined pointwise. Uh, we call Caesar algebra simple when it is not a direct sum of non-trivial Caesar algebras. Um, and it turns out the only finite-dimensional Caesar, uh, finite-dimensional simple Caesar algebras are uh, just um, the full set of bound operators on a finite-dimensional Hilbert space. Uh, which are just uh, the complex matrices. So I use this notation to represent uh, n by n matrices over a given field. Okay, I'm going to use this notation a bit more often in this course. Um, and you can show that if you have a finite dimensional Caesar algebra, you can write it as a direct sum of these uh, of these simple algebras. So you just get a uh, like a direct sum of these matrix algebras. It's just some nice representation here of Caesar algebras. Okay. Um, so. A problem you might have with Caesar algebras is that it has non self joint operators. So if you think about, like, okay, well, the self joint ones are observables, and if I want an algebra of observables, well, the Caesar algebras are not the correct thing because I have these non self joint things which don't correspond to observable quantities. So, like, can we construct an algebra that can just contain self joint operators? Okay. 
Uh, well, so there's a few notes there. Well, the self joint operators do not form a complex vector space. They form a real, help, uh, a real vector space. And the reason for that is because the, um, the dagger, the, the edge joints, uh, acts sesky linearly on complex numbers and not. So if I, if I have a uh, subject operator A and I multiply by the complex number I, then this becomes uh, anti, self, anti self joint. If I take the dagger, then it becomes with a minus sign. So it's a real helicity, not a complex one. Second observation, it's, it's not close on the product, right? Because if, I want, if A and B are self joint and I want their product to be self joint well, that only happens if AB is equal to BA, so only if they commute. Okay, so that's a problem. We can't use a regular product because that, that doesn't preserve uh, so, that doesn't preserve so, so drug rules. The interesting observation that was originally made by Wigner and von Neumann is that they are close on the squares. If A is self adjoint, then A squared is also self adjoint. Okay, well that's interesting. How can we use that to make an algebra structure out of it? Well, if I take the sum of two things and I square them and I subtract the original squares. Well, this is still self-adjoint, right? Because like it's a real help space, so it's close on these these, uh, these 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 subtractions, and it's close on the products. And like I can just do some algebra, and I see this is equal to this product. Okay, right, so this product preserves preserves self-adjointness. Okay, that's cool. What are the properties of this thing? Okay, well we can obviously see obviously see that this product is commutative and this bilinear. Okay, so like that that's nice. But is it associative? Like associative is a really nice property you want to have. Well, it turns out it's not associative. You can see this quite easily. It's just take these three matrices, for instance. Uh, you can show this thing is zero, but this thing is not zero. So it's not associative. So that's a bummer. Um, but luckily, there is something else we can do. So it satisfies this identity for all matrices A and B. And uh, we call this the Jordan identity. Um, I just want to say here as well that um, uh, you can see here if you take A equal to B, this just becomes A squared plus A squared, you take it to half, so it's just equal to A squared, right? So we can identify these two things. Okay. Mm. Okay, so this is an identity. So we can just make an algebra out of it, or just define a structure that has this thing. So we define a Jordan algebra to be any vector space with a bilinear commutative operation star, that satisfies this Jordan identity. Now, I know this looks super weird. Like, like this thing is like, like why? Why? Why would you care about this thing? Um, I think a nicer way to think about this is there is a hierarchy of of of, of associativity for algebras. At the top, you have associative algebras, and they're really nice, and we, and we care a lot about those. But um, and at the bottom, you have something which is completely non-associative, and like it's just horrible. Um, in between, you have things where if you take a single element and you look at the algebra this element generates, right? So you have A and you look at, and you look at A times A and you look at A times A times A or A times A times A, like different ways to combine elements with itself and also linear products. You can ask, is this algebra associative? And it turns out that this property precisely states that the algebra generated by the single element is associative. So this property is called power associative because it means that any way of writing a power of an element is equivalent. So if you take a squared times a squared, it's equal to a to the power of 4. And if you take a to the third times a, it's also equal to a to the power of 4. So it's called power associative. One step up would be um, called is, is alternative, which means that any algebra generated by two elements is associative. And then associative just means any algebra generated by three elements is, is associative. Mm -hmm. So there's this hierarchy of associativity and Jordan algebras exist on the first ladder. So that's kind of the intuition of why you want this. You want some kind of associativity. And what's the second step again? Uh, alternative. Okay. It's uh, when two elements generate an associative algebra. Uh, the, so if you, um, if you know the octonians, the octonians mm -hmm. are an alternative algebra. They're not associative. Yeah. All right, so... Um, uh, the canonical example of a Jordan algebra is we just take any associative algebra and we just define this, this operation. And this operation works if it's algebra is over any field which has like an inverse for two. So you can define this for anything. And then we get a Jordan algebra. And then this star we call the special Jordan product. Like it's just a, a useful way to refer to it. Okay. So in particular, um, I can take all the bounded operators in the Hilbert space. And this forms a Jordan algebra with complex numbers. But our goal was to get rid of the non self adjoint operators. So if this is a Jordan algebra, 
our definition is too general because we only want the self adjoint ones, right? Okay, so we need to add some assumption here that like gets rid of like the non self adjoint operators. So that condition turns out to be a thing called formally real, which says that if I have a sum of squares that equals zero, then each element must have been zero. Okay? And it turns out that if I take H to be a real, complex, or quaternionic Hilbert space, then the self agent operators form a formally real Jordan <coughs> algebra. Um, I don't know how many people know about, about quaternions. Like, uh, who, who here has heard about quaternions and knows roughly what they are? Okay, that's most people, so I'm not going to say much about it. It's not super important, but like, it's an interesting structure. Um, what is quite uh, weird, I have to say myself, is if we, let, uh, if we take the octonians, so it's kind of like the eight-dimensional algebra, so you go from one-dimensional is real numbers, two-dimensional is complex, four-dimensional number, four dimensional is quaternion, and eight-dimensional is, uh, is uh, octonians, then we can look at the matrices, uh, the three-by-three three matrices of the octonians, and they then take the self-adjoint ones, and those form a formally real Jordan algebra. But if we were to take the 4x4 four four matrices, those would not form a Jordan algebra. Okay? So 3x3 three three is the biggest ones you can get. And like, I still don't completely understand why, but like, you can just write down some identities that don't satisfy the Jordan identity. So it just goes wrong there. Okay. Um, all right, and then there's, uh, uh, there's one final class of uh, Jordan algebras I want to talk about. Um, so if we have a real Hilbert space, uh, and like I just said, like, suppose you want to put a Jordan algebra structure on it. Well, there's an obvious, sort of obvious choice of like how you want to define a product of two vectors, which is just, you take the inner product, but the problem is the inner product is a scalar, right? So the, the way we fix this is we just add the real numbers to this, to this Hilbert space so that we can make a scalar from vectors, okay? And then we just define like the algebra of the obvious manner. So we say, okay, the product of two vectors is the inner product. The product of two scalars is a scalar. The product of a vector and a scalar is another vector scaled by the scalar. Okay? And then we just extend this by, by, by linearity in sort of the only way. Uh, the thing we get then is what we call um, the n-dimensional spin factor. So we take the n-dimensional Hilbert space, the unique n-dimensional real Hilbert space, and we just, we just give it this product. And this turns out to be a formally real Jordan algebra. Uh, okay. Why is that uh, relevant? Um, that comes from the next slide. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Oh, uh, so uh, we've actually, yeah, there's a few. Um, so uh, the two dimensional spin factor uh, turns out to be equivalent to uh, the two by two self adjoint real matrices. And the three dimensional spin factor is equivalent to the two, two by two uh, complex self adjoint matrices. Uh, and the same for like uh, for the quaternions and octonions of the two two two, two matrices. The way you could see it with the, the with the complex matrices is if you take the Pauli matrices, you take the x, y, and z Pauli matrix, together with identity, they form a, a basis for the subjoint matrices of the two, two by two complex matrices. Um, these x, y, and z they span a real Hilbert space, and um, if you uh, and they turn out if you take the trace to be the the inner product then they are orthogonal, and if you define their product to be the anti commutator then that is uh, zero. So then you can show that this forms, that, that forms exactly the Hilbert space with the structure here for the spin factor. So a, a qubit is basically a special case of the spin factor, you could say that way. Uh, anyway, the reason I tell you this about spin factors is that um, von Neumann, Wickler and Jordan, they defined what they called R number systems, what we now know as Jordan algebras, because they hope to generalize the space of observables of a quantum system. So they hope that like, uh, with this abstract definition of Jordan algebra, we can find new interesting like, systems and we can try to make experiments and test that maybe our systems are described by this thing instead of complex Hilbert spaces. But they were disappointed to uh, learn that that's actually not the case. Um, so we, we call a formally real Jordan algebra special when it embeds into a complex Hilbert space. Okay, so the same way as like, a C-star algebra embeds in a complex Hilbert space, like, than for Jordan algebras. Um, well, obviously, the matrices over complex numbers and matrices over real numbers, they're special. They just embed in the obvious way in such a bundle version of Hilbert space. Uh, for the quaternions, you can embed it into, like, you need, to, you need to up the dimension by two. That's basically because the quaternions are, as an algebra, isomorphic to the 2 by 2 complex matrices. Um, 
It turns out that every spin factor is also special via a Clifford algebra construction, which I'm not going to say more about. Uh, but it turns out that the 3 by 3 octonium matrices are not special, and we call it an exceptional algebra. Uh, they're all special or exceptional. Um, and then the question is, like, are there other exceptional Jordan algebras? And the answer to that is no. So they proved in 1934 that any real, finite dimensional, formally real Jordan algebra is uh, a direct sum of simple Jordan algebras, each of which is isomorphic to one of these types. So it's either the real matrix, <coughs> or it's a matrix algebra over the real complex numbers of quaternions, or there's a spin factor, or there's an exceptional Jordan algebra. Okay? The corollary of that is that... Um, that any Jordan algebra is isomorphic to something that embeds into a complex Hilbert space and just some number of copies of this weird fine dimensional algebra, fine like simple algebra. So this sort of like restricts like like that means like you don't really get any generalizations for uh, for quantum theory. Like like in this sense, Jordan algebras are a dead end. Like you can't you don't generalize quantum theory. So they were disappointed by this, but uh, five minutes okay. Um, let's see, five minutes. Yeah, I mean, I want to talk about another topic, but it's not super important. We could just stop here. Like, um, yeah, I, w I w want to say a bit more about quantum logic, um, but yeah, I think it's going to take too much time. So, yeah, it's going to skip to the conclusions. Yeah, conclusion. Okay. Uh, yeah, so the conclusion of this is that you can get operators in complex Hilbert space via c star algebras, or you can get them via formally real Jordan algebras. Um, and the thing I skipped, you can also get them by the structure of automotor lattices if you have enough properties on it. If you are, if you are interested uh, in this stuff, you can ask me and I can go through it. Um, and then if we have like, complex uh, Hilbert spaces, then we get the correct state via Gleason's theorem, we get the correct dynamics via Wigner plus Stone. Um, so what really remains to us is like, to find the compelling reasons why we should prefer one of these three structures. And then we would have derived quantum theory from first principles. Uh, yeah, and that's it. Thank you.